I'm here today to talk to Her Excellency Dr. Joyce Banda of Malawi. Dr. Banda was the first woman president of Malawi, the second woman to head a state in all of Africa. Dr. Banda, a great welcome to the Institute of Public Affairs. You have a phenomenal record of being a businesswoman, a civil society activist, and you rose to become the first woman head of state in Malawi. If you were me introducing you to a group of people who hadn't known your record or your background, what would you say about the woman, Joyce Banda? Um, the woman, Joyce Banda, is a person that is a leader, a servant leader, self-made, a woman who believes that this world should be a better place for all. So I am a woman who has tried to live my life, reaching out to make this world a better place for all, both rich and poor. And Dr. Banda, you, I believe, at the age of 30, gave yourself a mission statement for life. Perhaps you could tell us what that is, and that connects, I believe, to what you've just told us about the woman, Joyce Banda. I made up my mind when I was 30 years old that I was going to spend my life assisting women and youth gain social and political empowerment. So those people who have seen me work, those people who have seen me head organizations, those people who have seen me as gender minister pushing for bills to protect the family, domestic violence, those people who have seen me fight violence against women, those people who have seen me even as a foreign minister, where I should have been on the international stage and not so much back home, those that have seen me as vice president and president will know that every day if they look closely, it's about fulfilling my mission in life. And you've talked about the domestic violence bill. You've been public about leaving an abusive marriage. Those are not easy topics to fight around in whatever position you find yourself. How was it to raise those really difficult, often taboo areas, to deal with them in your private life and then to follow through and deal with it in your political life? I truly believe that I'm a woman who is very fortunate, that uh, whatever I have fought for in my life, meaning the issues I have advanced, the issues I have worked on, the issues I have worked, I have, I have tried to advance, have all originated from personal experience. So for me, I've spent my life sending girls to school. Yeah. Because growing up, a very good friend of mine, who was brighter than me, all, we went all the way to end of primary school. She, went, she was selected to go to the best girls in the school and me to the best in the school. She went one time and didn't go back because they couldn't raise the uh, six dollars, six pounds that she needed to go to school. When I was 33, giving birth to my fourth born child, I suffered what they call postpartum hemorrhage. Mm. And then that woke me up because most people die because they bleed to death, because they are not delivering their baby in a hospital mm. or assisted by trained personnel. When I was 21, I got married and ended up in an abusive marriage. So all the things that I have pushed is because I've lived them. And people have said the difference they see in me as I advance these issues, as I push for these issues, there's some passion that they can't explain. But I think it originates from the fact that I've lived those situations and therefore I don't want that to happen to any other woman if I can help it. I don't want to accept a woman dying, giving life, because I almost died. Yes. I don't want a woman suffering in an abusive marriage because I was there. And I don't want anybody to fail to go to school, a girl child, when I can help it. For a lot of women to be able to talk about living with abuse and then creating a life free from abuse is a painful and traumatic thing to do especially in contexts where 
it's not talked about or where women are blamed for abuse that they suffer. Was this a very difficult thing for you to do or was it something that you felt driven to do so that you could share with others as you've talked to us about? Uh, I think I got to a point where I had to leave. But at that point, I didn't know it would be the tool I could use to empower others. At that point, what was paramount, what really pushed me were my children. Mm. Did I want them to grow up in this situation? Somebody told me, I was very young then, but somebody told me that children that grow in an abusive situation end up being abusive themselves. Did I want to build, to allow my children into monsters when I could do something about it? Mm. So I moved on. Then, 24 months later, 21 months, 21, between 21 and 24, I got married again mm. to a fine man. This time, I was stronger. Economically, I was empowered. I was able to negotiate and to bargain and to make sure I was entering into a situation, uh, into a relationship that was going to be uh, reciprocal, mutual, res filled with respect. And I'm going to come back to the personal stuff in a minute, but you carried that lived reality of abuse and your commitment to changing the situation for women, other women, you carried that and threw into your, one of your first political acts once you were elected. So you picked up the domestic violence bill. Yeah, the, the domestic violence bill ha had not been drafted by me. But my reason for going to parliament was to go and sit where the laws are made so I can participate in changing those that negatively impact on women and children. After all, that was my mission in life, just fulfilling it. So when I got to that office as Minister of Women and Children, it was like I was in a hurry as if I was going to run out of time. I had to find a bill that I had to push. I had to think about, is it the Marriage Act? Is it inheritance? Is it violence against women? And I had to be very sensitive about the climate that time, about the mood of those that were going to support me, particularly in a male-dominated parliament. Exactly. So I had to find one that sounded neutral, one that would mean everybody who lives in the house, a servant, a child, a wife, a husband, domestic violence, mm. so that my fellow woman in that house can pick can pick the tool that belongs to her within the bill and run with it. Mm. That was my hope. So it says it's domestic violence is illegal? Yeah, they, they, they makes, it says that domestic violence is illegal. But the best part of that, yes. that, that, that act says that a woman can evict her husband yeah. if she's being abused. And, and vice versa, because it's domestic violence. Okay. And vice versa. But it, it then makes the woman stronger. Yeah, because many times in many places, in case of domestic violence, we ask people ask why doesn't the woman leave? Yeah, but actually your your the law but that you I, got I, introduced says actually she doesn't have to leave or the victim doesn't yeah. have to leave. Yeah, because the abuser yeah. has to leave. Yeah, because sometimes they will say how can I leave? Where can I go? There's no excuse. Mm. They must go. Mm. They, I mean, they must ask him to leave mm. because the bill gives her the power to right. own the property to stay in the property. Right. The tragedy in our society is that sometimes it is the woman who will not want to reveal that she's being abused or to go to the police or they go to the police and let him out, right. get him out because they want to, they right. want the, he, right. the, the support that the husband so gives. So that, what that story tells us, Your Excellency, is you've gone from a victim of abuse, um, somebody married relatively young at 21, victim of abuse to somebody who's able to speak about it and leave Mm -hmm. who then decided that she didn't want other women to suffer to she go through had, it, yeah. but who was able to take that through. You told me earlier that you had done everything you could in civil society and you wanted to go in and be where the laws were made because that's what needed to be changed, yeah. and you were yeah. able to do that. That's a nice, complete journey you've made on that. Um, the yeah, but also realizing, but also realizing that um, when a woman is not economically empowered, if she's not making uh, economic contribution towards the household, 
it's also a problem. She becomes vulnerable. Your role, though, the, the important thing that I wanted to pull out here was how you went from the journey of being a, a, a woman who was abused to a woman who was able to leave that abuse, carve out a new life, reach and then out, make a difference reach to, out to other others, women in the uh, similar And then position. make sure there's a law passed. Yeah, and make that real difference yeah. at a national level. I'd just like to pick up on a couple of key relationships that are featured in your story. Your husband, obviously, uh, the good man you describe and who you introduced as Africa's first, first gentleman. You also spoke very um, praisingly of your grandmother. Can you tell us a little bit about why she was so special to you and in making you who you are today? Um, my, my grandmother was a very strong woman. I don't think she went to school very much. But mm. she, I'm told that she worked. She told me that she had she went in Zomba when they opened two hospitals. Mm. In those days of segregation, mm. there was a, a hospital for Africans and there was a hospital for uh, white people. And so she went and worked as a maid or cleaner there. I don't know what it is that she did. At a time when women didn't work. Then she comes back to the village and establishes herself in the village, had a big house, glass thatched, but big. She fed everybody. Yes. But you can only feed others. What she told me very early in my life was that you can only reach out and help others when you have enough. So what you, where you need to start from is to have enough. And enough doesn't come on its own. This world is about work. You need to work to empower yourself. And you don't have to be a man or a woman to achieve that. The fourth thing that she taught me was that you must never accept abuse. You must always ask. Don't just look. Because in our, my upbringing, it's in your best interest if you go like this. If you don't go like this. Yes. Then you're a good woman because you're quiet. Humble. Yeah, you're humble. But she was t teaching me to do the opposite. Look up, straighten the eye. And ask why. Mm. Yeah, and ask why. Make sure that somebody is accountable. Don't just accept abuse. Mm. So she built in me not to be arrogant, but but to make sure that I know my rights and I must push for them in a very subtle way yeah. without being antagonistic. Right. Yeah. Right. You've made an incredible journey from being a, a young girl in your grandmother's house, being sent out to sell sugarcane in the morning, and also being really advantaged by having the advice she gave you. Look people in the eye, ask questions, and don't accept abuse. That must have prepared you well for public life. We're interested in preparing the next generation coming through and um, learning from the women um, who've gone before. Yeah. If a woman was to ask you and say, I want to be president one day, Dr. Banda, what advice can you give me? In, in countries, most, most countries in Africa, there is stiff competition for you to break that grass ceiling. So there's no way I am going to come to you and say I have gone to school and have a degree and therefore I'm ready yeah. and it, it won't happen. You need an economic base first. And as I've always said, it doesn't matter what number of degrees you have. Mm. What matters most is what you do with that education once you leave that classroom. Dr. Banda, thank you so much for joining us as our first professor of practice. We have a lot to learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you.